Again, good morning to you all. It is so good to see all of you. I welcome those who may be worshiping with us for the first time, either here in the sanctuary or online. I thank Kyle Hastings, who is our tech person this morning. The altar flowers today have been given in loving memory of Jean Weberg by her daughter, Karen. Also, as we begin, a reminder that masks now are optional. And to paraphrase the Apostle Paul, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus for those who mask and for those who do not mask. I know that a minister of discipleship has a few announcements. Good morning. Today is Bible Sunday, so we invite you all to celebrate with us after the service. The third graders will come up to get their Bible in just a little bit, and we also ask the third graders to join us in the sanctuary for a few minutes after the service to take some pictures. Um, also, a save the date on Palm Sunday, April 10th, for our Heifer birthday bash. We are still looking for some bakers as we raise money for Heifer International that donates livestock to families in impoverished areas and also gives them education to use that livestock to make a living for their families. So I'm going to invite Savannah and her horse to come on up and the cow whose name is Winnie the Moo. Ooh. And I'm going to have Savannah come all the way to the microphone so we can hear her. It's hard to walk up those steps with animals attached to you. So Savannah has some questions for Winnie the Moo. Hi, Winnie the Moo. Can you teach my horse today? She forgot. That's not right. Can we try again? Thanks, you did it. So if you are really excited about being a cow, or if you have a child who would like to help with our announcements for the next few weeks, please let me know. And either way, please join us to raise some money for a heifer and enjoy some cake on Palm Sunday. Thank you. I'm also going to invite Don Putney forward. He has an announcement as well. Good morning. Following yesterday's uh, funeral, there was a wonderful collation with a wonderful lot of food and a wonderful lot of sandwiches left that we ask you to join us afterwards and have lunch with us after church. Uh, for those at home who didn't hear, one of our children said, okay. <laughs> I have a couple of another, uh, other announcements to share this morning. Uh, first of all, there are song sheets for the power of your love. When we have a song that is a little new to people, you, there will always be copies of it on the table as you enter the sanctuary. The outreach ministry is concluding this uh, Sunday. The Diaper drive. We thank everyone for the very generous uh, donations. I'd like to take a moment uh, to give thanks and dedicate all these offerings. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks uh, for this community of uh, faith and its generosity. A generosity that always uh, comes forward and goes the extra mile to help our sisters and brothers and all who are in need. We give you thanks uh, for these gifts and pray that it will share the love of Christ that we all know as a part of this community of faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Reminder that this year we will resume our Easter Vigil that runs from the conclusion of our gathering on Good Friday to midnight on Easter morning. The sign-up is in the Hilltop News. 
There's also a sign up in the Hilltop News for Easter flowers that will decorate the sanctuary on Easter morning. I believe there are also hard copies on the table to your right as you leave the sanctuary. Up in Fellowship Hall, you will find a sign-up sheet for lobster bisque that's on the table as you go into your right. And also on that table, there are candles that are being offered for supporting our sisters and brothers in Ukraine. They have sunflowers on them, which is the national flower of that country. We continue to grieve with the terrible things that are being inflicted upon those good people. This is another way to support them, and all that is raised for the sale of the candles will be matched. Also in the pews, there are offering envelopes to help the people of the Ukraine. As many of you know, we are continuing to do a fundraiser with the customers at China Cuisine. And this morning, we add to that which has already been raised a total of $5,882, which brings the total raised thus far to a little over $20,000. Are there any other announcements? If not, then let us continue our journey to that hill far away that we might enter into the grace that is from everlasting to everlasting. Please join me in the call to worship. Long ago, God sang the world into being. And our hearts began to beat with joyful praise. When the melody grew faith, God sent Jesus of Nazareth. To sing the song with us again. A song of peace in the darkest of nights. A song of courage for the living of these days. A song of hope when the future looks bleak. A song that promises us that the God's love will go on.
in the prayer of invocation. God of all that has been and all that is yet to be, and who is with us even now, I thank you for this day and another opportunity to begin again. So in this time of Sabbath rest, draw near to me and help me to look beyond the frailness of my heart and my frayed history so that I can see what can be done when I give myself to you. Holy One, help me to believe the good news that you were in Christ reconciling the world to yourself. And let me be born again each day with the rising of the sun, that I may be a faithful ambassador of Christ and his life-changing grace. This I ask as we say again the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. As we continue to worship and praise our God who is from everlasting to everlasting, let us come now to God's altar with our tithes and our offerings.
please join me in the prayer of dedication. We come to your altar, Lord, with humble gratitude for your reconciling love in Christ Jesus. As we walk the path to the cross on that hill far away, we bring you this offering that we may faithfully follow the one who is the resurrection and the life. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite the Bible recipients up. So as I call your name, please come on up, and then you'll stay standing between Reverend Hughes and myself while we do the presentation. So Benjamin Slisky. Connor Goshi. Wyatt Baker. And Jolie Philzame. And Dorothy will be getting hers at a later date. Unfortunately, she could not be here today. We will also need a recycling bin. So do you guys know what's inside these packages? What is it? Bibles. Bibles. Not very good at keeping a secret, am I? <laughs> what does the wrapping paper look like? What color is it? Brown. The brown paper reminds us that this is a very old book, a book of 30 centuries. It's difficult even to imagine that many centuries. Some parts were written more than 1,000 years before Jesus was even Born. Some of the stories are so old, they were told long before people knew how to write. This is an ancient, sacred book of our faith. You may carefully remove the brown paper. You can rip it, just try not to rip the next layer. What does this layer of wrapping paper look like? Maps. These maps are created with roads, highways, rivers, and oceans. They give us directions on how to get somewhere. It may be Boston or California or Florida. The Bible gives us directions on how to live our lives. Go ahead and carefully remove the maps. Now, what does this layer look like? Gold. Although we think of gold as being the most valuable thing there is, the Bible is even more valuable. It is the source of truth and guidance for our lives, and all the gold in the world cannot buy these things. There was a time in history when Bibles were chained to the pulpit so they would not be stolen. In some churches, the Bible is decorated with jewels to show how much it is valued. Our Bible, with its sacred scriptures, is both ancient and valuable. Go ahead and carefully remove the gold paper. This white layer stands for light and purity, this Bible is a gift from God. Reading the Bible is our way of finding out what God has in store for God's people. We get to know more about what the Bible says as we study our special lessons during Sunday school. Go ahead and remove this layer of paper.
I told you we need the recycling bin. I learned that the first year we did this. The Bibles we give out this morning are a gift from your church family. We hope you will read through your Bible and enjoy them. Ask your parents, Reverend Hughes, myself, or any member of our church family any questions that you might have about your Bible and the stories you read. I also have for you a case for your Bible so you can bring it back and forth to Sunday school with you. And a bookmark with favorite Bible verses from Reverend Hughes, myself, and your parents. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, thank you for this day, for these third graders, and for these Bibles. We ask for your blessing over these Bibles and for your guidance for these young people and also for Christians around the world, that we may read your word with open minds and open hearts. And we ask that you help us to always share your love and your light with those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Children's message. It is always a joy to see the children come forward with the big smiles on their faces. And I'm not sure you all get to see that because they're facing this way, but I look forward to it every year. So I have a question for the children this morning, and actually it isn't just for the children, it's a question for all of us, but I'm going to address it to the children. Do you ever fight with your sisters or brothers? Yes, yes there's an honest, that is known as confession. <laughs> Do you ever fight with friends of yours or maybe even people you don't know? It happens all the time. Maybe you're playing a video game and you think that your sister or brother has had more than enough time for their turn and now it's your turn. Or maybe you're on the playground and someone does something that you don't think is right. Maybe you think they cheated and so you get into a big fight. Jesus doesn't like it when we fight because Jesus knows that fighting only makes things worse. And as I thought about that, I was reminded of a very special lake. <coughs> this lake isn't far from here. It's in Webster, Massachusetts. And it is famous, even though you might not know it. It's famous because it is the lake, and I see some of you nodding to each other so you know its claim to fame. It has the longest name of any geographical place in the United States. That's the name of the lake. I'm going to invite a minister of discipleship to come and join me. I was just going to invite you to try and say that. You can't pronounce that? I thought I'd let you try first. Oh, okay. So you're going to see if I do it right. The name of the lake is Cha Gagagag Man Cha Gagagag Cha Banatungamag. I'm pretty sure I've heard you say that before, actually, now that I think of it. Uh, so you should know how to say it. I guess I should. Yeah. You don't? Uh, you are so good at it, you can just take the lead and say each uh, time. Very good. So. I'm going to suggest that we say it in phrases, okay? So you repeat after me. Cha ga ga gog. Cha ga ga gog. Man cha ga ga gog. Man cha ga ga gog. Cha banagungamog. Cha. 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 Banagungamog. Banagungamog. 
okay? Cha ga 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 man cha ga 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 cha ba ba na ga ba. We'll all do it together. Cha ga ga ga, man cha ga ga ga, cha ba na ga ga ba. There you go. Cha ga ga ga, man cha ga ga ga, cha ba na ga ga ba. Now, what you might not know is the story behind the name for the lake. This name, obviously, is a Native American name, and it came about because there were two tribes of Nicmac Indians in that area, and they were fighting over the fishing in the lake. They each thought that each tribe was taking too much of the fish, and they didn't like that. So they got together and they came up with a solution. If you translate that name into English, it means you fish on your side of lake, I fish on my side of lake, no one fish in middle. Great way to stop the fighting. It sounds like when you put the tape down the middle of your bedroom. <laughs> you have to tape down the middle of the bedroom. And most people simply know it as Webster Lake. But I love that story because it reminds us that fighting doesn't solve anything. It only makes things worse, and Jesus doesn't want us to fight. And this morning, we have in our Bible reading a passage that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians. And he says something very important. He says, God has been reconciled, or we have been reconciled with God through Jesus, and that God has given us a ministry of reconciliation. And reconciliation is a big word that simply means bringing people who aren't seeing eye to eye together so that they stop fighting and they're not angry at each other. And that's what God wants us to do, and there are a number of ways we can do it. One way we can do it is when we do something wrong, we say, I'm sorry. And when someone does something that isn't right to us, we say, I forgive you. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that in Jesus you came to bring your love to us and that on the cross you remind us that there's nothing that we can do that will ever make you stop loving us. Help us to love each other and when we want to fight with someone, Help us to find ways to love each other instead. Amen.
Please be seated. Please join me in the responsive call to prayer. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Good people, let us enter into this time of stillness that we might be at one with our God. My sisters and brothers, are there prayers that you would like to lift up to the Lord this day? Yes, Tom. Um, I'd like to uh, have prayers offered for my friend, uh, Laurie Gonsalves, oh. who recently has been diagnosed with melanoma and is now undergoing uh, uh, chemotherapy and is presently responding well to it. So we lift up Laurie Gonsalves, who is being treated for cancer, we ask that God's spirit of healing be upon her. Lord, in your goodness, Amen. I lift up in prayer Roy Walters. I received word yesterday that he was hospitalized for a couple of days this past week after suffering a TIA. He is now home. We ask that God's healing be upon him. Lord, in your goodness, Amen. I will also offer that prayer for Jim Goldsmith. He also had a TIA this past week and is at home. We ask that God's healing be with him. Lord, in your goodness. The flowers to my right were from the service yesterday, celebrating the life and the promise of the resurrection for Arlene Lum Garlington. And I thank also the care ministry who provided the wonderful collation. Their dedication is wonderful. It is the efforts of so many in a congregation that keeps us going and makes it possible for us to share the love of Christ with those near and far. We give thanks for that. Lord, in your goodness. And we pray that God's spirit will be with Arlene's husband, Chuck, as he continues his journey of life. Lord, in your goodness. We lift up Sharon McGilvery as she continues with her new chemo and pray that it will bring healing and health to her. Lord, in your goodness. Also, as many of you know, we've been praying for the people of Ukraine and one of those people we've been praying for is a friend of Lauren Jenkins. His name is Ihor and his mother was the woman who had the 12 refugees in her basement, and their house was bombed. Fortunately, the family had moved out to a safe house outside of Kiev, and they are all safe. Ihor is now in Spain. His mother and the rest of his family is in Croatia. His father, who is a doctor, is still in Ukraine, and we pray for them and all of the people of that country. Lord, in your goodness. We also lift up Sandy Hayes' son, Billy Hayes, and he is preparing for a stem cell transplant. We pray that that will be successful. Lord, in your goodness. Oh, Lauren, sorry, I did not um, see you raising your hand. If we could pray for the McMullen family, my husband lost his brother. Oh, I'm sorry, and your brother, uh, your brother-in-law's name? Bill. Bill. And it was sudden, so. It was sudden, very sorry. So we lift up Jay and uh, Lauren and the entire McMullen family as they say their sacred goodbyes and unanticipated. We ask that God give them strength. Lord, in your goodness. Oh, 
my goodness, I better put my glasses on. I'm sorry. I'm not seeing you all raise your hands. Prayers for my most wonderful neighbor, Doreen. Doreen? We just found out um, she has stage four cancer. So we... Okay, so we lift up Debbie Zatola's neighbor, Doreen, who has stage four cancer. We ask that God walk with her and her loved ones in this difficult time. Lord, in your goodness. I think I saw her. Oh, thank you. I, I had it here and I missed it. I just want to convey our thanks. And Derek wants to say that he's really appreciative of your visit, Rick, and all the prayers that he's receiving as he recovers. He is home and it's going to be a long process. But yeah. Right. So, as some of you probably saw in the Hilltop News, Darren Malik had a blood clot in his lung. can be very serious. He is home. We ask that God's healing continue to be on him. Lord, in your goodness. Let us pray. Holy and most gracious God, we give you thanks for this body of Christ, this family of faith, where we can come together and know that when one weeps, all weep together. And when one rejoices, we all rejoice. As we continue our journey, our sacred journey in these days of Lent, we do so knowing that you were calling us to that hill far away. Help us uh, to open our hearts to the grace uh, that we see in that sacrifice of love that we may then continue on to celebrate with all of our hearts and minds and strength the glory of the empty tomb. Holy One, you have heard our prayers, both those that we have spoken and those that are in our hearts. And for that, we give you thanks. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, beginning with the 16th verse. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once regarded Christ from a human point of view. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We beseech you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled, to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here ends the reading of the word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts upon the sacred scripture be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and always our Redeemer. Amen. With everything that's going on these days, it wouldn't surprise me if some of you feel the same way a minister felt when he went for a bike ride one sunny spring afternoon. 
As the minister was riding his bike, he saw a lawnmower with a for sale sign on it. When he stopped to take a closer look, a youngster came out of the house to see if he had any questions. Well, the minister said, I'm wondering why you want to sell the lawnmower. Because, the youngster replied, I'm tired of mowing lawns and I want to use the money to get a bike. When the minister heard that, he offered to trade his bike for the lawnmower. The youngster thought it was a great idea, but asked if he could go for a ride on the bike before he agreed to the deal. When the minister said yes, the youngster climbed onto the bike and off he went. When the youngster came back a little while later, the minister wasn't in a very good mood. After he wiped the sweat off of his face, he said, son, I'm afraid that lawnmower isn't any good. I kept pulling on that rope and I couldn't get it to start. Oh, the youngster said, that's because if you want it to start, you have to cuss at it. The minister shook his head and said, I'm sorry, I'm a man of God. I gave my life to Jesus when I was 13 years old, and it's been so long since I cussed, I don't even think I can remember how to do it. That's okay, the youngster said, just keep putting, pulling on that rope and it'll come back to you. <laughs> Frustrating. That's one way of describing everything that's going on these days. You could also use words like frightening and foreboding. People are arguing about everything these days. When it comes to things like immigration and abortion, critical race theory, gender identity, climate change, and vaccination mandates, people aren't just debating each other. They're demonizing each other. And it feels sometimes like it's a duel to the death. All of the nastiness and the negativity and the name calling isn't just sad, it's downright scary. That's why I'm going to keep working on my faith. And I encourage all of you to keep working on your faith. I say that because a casual faith isn't going to get us through all of this chaotic craziness. What we need is the kind of faith that the Apostle Paul is talking about in his letter to the Corinthians. In the beginning of this reading this morning, Paul shares these words. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one from a human point of view. Now that's really amazing when you think about it. If there's a human point of view, then that must mean there's also a heavenly point of view, which is very different. Paul is telling us that there is a big difference between the way we see each other and the way God sees us. And if we're honest with ourselves, that human point of view is what's got us into all of these headaches and hassles and heartache. That's because the human point of view focuses on our differences and the things about other people that we don't like. For example, the human point of view looks at someone and says, that woman is speaking Spanish. If she wants to live in this country, she should learn how to speak English. The human point of view looks at someone and says, my neighbor down the street is on welfare. With all the help wanted ads in the newspaper these days, he could find a job if he really wanted to work. That human point of view was also on display a little over a week ago at the St. Patrick's Day Parade in South Boston. Many of you are probably familiar with what happened since it was in the news. Apparently, a group of people wearing masks 
and wearing neo-Nazi clothing, held up a sign that said, keep Southie Irish. That human point of view was also what prompted a middle school student in Westford, Westwood to do what he did. Once again, you may be familiar with ha what happened. It was in the news. Apparently, this student used the airdrop feature on his iPhone to send racist text messages to other students with iPhones as they were passing each other in a crowded hallway. Actually, to be fair, since the student wasn't identified, it could have been a she rather than a he who sent those racist text messages. All of this is why I really like the story about a close encounter that Reverend Robert Schuler had many years ago. Robert Schuler, of course, was the senior pastor at the Crystal Cathedral in Garden Grove, California. One day as he was driving his car, he was involved in a minor fender bender with a car in front of him. Immediately after it happened, the driver of the other car got out and he started to shout and scream and swear profusely at the good reverend. The irate driver went on and on when he finally paused to catch his breath. Reverend Schuler looked at him and said, Mr. Jesus loves you and I'm trying. Now, I like that story because it shows you very clearly the difference between the human point of view and the heavenly point of view. The human point of view looks for the bad in people. The heavenly point of view looks for the good in people. The human point of view leads to anger and accusations. It leads to condemnation and conflict. The heavenly point of view leads to healing and hope. It leads to respect and reconciliation. The heavenly point of view leads to a heart that is full of the love that is patient and kind. The love that isn't irritable or resentful, that is not arrogant or rude, and most important of all, that heavenly point of view leads to lead you to a heart that is full of the love that doesn't always insist on its own way. Good people, it is that heavenly view, it is that faith that will save us from ourselves. And all of this leads us back to the Apostle Paul and the letter that he wrote to the Corinthians. Do you know what made it possible for Paul to go from a human point of view to a heavenly point of view? Or, as he puts it in his letter, to no longer regard anyone from a human point of view? It was the sacrificial love that he saw on the cross. That's why in his letter he reminds us that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting our trespasses against us. That sacrificial love touched Paul's heart. It changed Paul's heart, and it changed the way he looked at other people. That's because the sacrificial love of God, who was in Christ on that cross, changes everything. It changes, first of all, your relationship with God. And it changes your relationship with people you know and people you don't know and people you don't like. That's because you understand in your heart that on that cross, Christ died for you. But guess what? Christ also died for the guy who has the back the blue sign on his front lawn and the woman who has the Black Lives Matter sign on her lawn. Christ died for the teenager with the purple and the green hair, the elderly grandmother from Guatemala, the guy who likes to wear the Let's Go Brandon t-shirt, and everyone else who pushes your buttons. 
The love of God in Christ on that cross changes everything. And here's something else that's really amazing. Did you notice that in his letter, Paul says that God has given us this ministry of reconciliation. Paul says that in his letter, and then just to drive the point home, in the very next verse, he says that God has entrusted to us this ministry of reconciliation. Do you know what that means? God wants us to be a community of faith that looks at everyone from that heavenly point of view. God wants us to be a community of faith that brings people from all walks of life together. A community of faith where it isn't a sin to be different. God wants us to be a community of faith where someone who is straight can sit in the pew and hold hands with someone who is gay. A community of faith where the love in a person's heart is way, way more important than the color of that person's skin. That's what happened many years ago when a young college student walked into a sanctuary just as the minister was beginning his sermon. Now this was back in the days where hippies lived in communes and you had flower power children walking on campuses all across the country. That's why the congregation really noticed the young college student as he made his way to the front of the sanctuary. He had long hair. He was wearing a t-shirt with ripped jeans. And most shocking of all, he wasn't wearing any shoes. People watched. And then they didn't know what to think when he got to the front of the sanctuary and instead of sitting in the pew, he got down and sat on the floor in front of the pew. Shortly after he did that, an elderly deacon got up at the back of the sanctuary and began to make his way toward the young college student. The elderly deacon was a distinguished gentleman in his 80s who always wore a three-piece suit and walked with a cane. As he made his way to the front of the sanctuary, the minister stopped preaching. The only sound people heard was the tap, tap, tap of the deacon's cane on the floor. People braced themselves for the confrontation that was about to take place. Much to their surprise, though, when he got to the front of the sanctuary, the elderly deacon put down his cane. Then, with some difficulty, he lowered himself down so he could sit on the floor next to the young college student. In that moment, the mood in the sanctuary changed. I would say that it went from a human point of view to a heavenly point of view. The minister looked at the young college student and the elderly deacon. Then he looked at the congregation and said, people, what I am about to say, you will never remember. But what you have just seen, you will never forget. That's all the minister said that day. It's all he needed to say. Good people, this is the faith that will save us. This is the faith that God is calling us to embody here and out there. So I invite you to join me in the ministry of reconciliation that has been entrusted to us. Amen.
People of God, our service of worship has ended. Let us go forth wherever we may be to continue our service of love, knowing that our God goes before us. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit, be upon you all. Amen. Thank you.